Okay, good morning everyone. Sorry for the late start. Uh, we are working our way through attempts to cross the reality gap. We will finish off lecture 17 uh, in the first few minutes of class this morning and move on to the penultimate attempt to cross the reality gap that we're going to talk about in this class, which is the transferability project. Speaking of projects, any questions about final projects? I haven't heard from anyone for a while, for a couple days, so that sounds good. I don't have any tips and tricks to share for the moment. Okay, back to the reality gap. So we were talking about uh, a project that I was uh, a part of to try and cross the reality gap, uh, which has the terrible name of the estimation exploration algorithm. Uh, terrible for several reasons. One of them is that it's not true. There are actually three E's involved in this project. Three evolutionary algorithms. One that tries to estimate the robot's state, how the robot is put together, possibly estimate the robot's environment, but we didn't tackle that in this first experiment. Second evolutionary algorithm down here exploits the evolved or estimated self-model. It exploits it to evolve a neural controller that is then transferred to the physical robot. As the robot is trying to estimate itself or learn about itself, it alternates back and forth between the estimation, explora uh, estimation evolutionary algorithm and the exploration evolutionary algorithm. A lot of ease in this algorithm. The exploration algorithm is exploring its own body, body, but it is not exploring its own body randomly. It is exploring it in a non-random fashion. The physical robot is looking for what action to perform next by looking for the action that when supplied to all its current guesses about how it's put together, like the four examples here, it's looking for the action that causes these four self-models to disagree in their prediction about what would happen if that action was performed on the physical robot. Just a little review. Yeah, all good? Okay. So let's go through these just again very quickly and think about the phenotype, the genotype, and the fitness. So the phenotype in the estimation algorithm is the robot's body, right? It's searching over the space of all possible bodies, all the ways of putting all of these pieces together. And as we talked about last time, the fitness of any one of these models is how close the virtual sensor data that it generates matches the physical sensor data. In the exploration algorithm, the phenotype is in action. Rotate one or two motors down and rotate all the others up. And the fitness, as we just said, is getting these trying to find actions that get these models to disagree as much as possible. And then finally, this one should be pretty familiar to you. The phenotype is the neural network controller that controls the virtual robot. Fitness, as always, or as usual, is forward displacement. Okay, so just, just a review of what this uh, algorithm looks like. Let's have a look at some of the data that we generated. I showed you some of the videos uh, of a single experiment. And if you remember, that single experiment has two phases. In the first phase, in the first phase, we're evolving, ultimately evolving controllers for the undamaged robot to walk. At the end of phase one, we went in and injured the robot uh, in some way, and then just kept this algorithm running, and it gradually adapts the robot adapts its self-model to reflect its new injured state, and we see how well it can then evolve a way to walk in its injured state. Yeah. This work was actually carried out on a funding uh, award for NASA. Uh, as you can imagine, as NASA is developing the next generation of probes that they want to send to the uh, outer planets and moons uh, in the outer solar system, something goes wrong uh, for the for the rover, the probe, when it gets to the planet or moon's surface, as far as we know, there's nobody there to fix it if something goes wrong. Yeah? For very good reasons, NASA is a very conservative engineering firm, among other things, right? Safety, 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 redundancy on top of redundancy, because most of the machines that NASA uh, makes and deploys are operating in remote environments. Yeah? So NASA approached us to develop something that would serve as what they call as a method of last resort. 
So imagine we send uh, a wheeled rover uh, to Mars and the landing comes in a little bit too hot. It breaks off one of the wheels. If that rover has a camera and it can see what's actually happened, it can communicate that back to mission control on Earth. Software engineers can write a compensating controller for the rover and then upload it remotely back to, to the rover. What happens if something goes wrong where the telemetry that's coming back from, from uh, the probe doesn't match what the engineers think it should be doing, but the probe also can't see and can't uh, directly diagnose what's gone wrong. Something's gone wrong. The, the mission is in danger. Uh, the mission is in danger of losing tax, millions of taxpayer dollars. The engineers don't know what's gone wrong. At that point uh, in NASA's rule book, they will consider or they'll deploy or they'll switch on methods of last resort. This is a prototype for one of those methods of last resort. Let the robot itself, let the, let the rover figure out what's gone wrong and figure it out very carefully. It's allowed to perform a few additional actions to figure out what's gone wrong, but not too many. That's where the exploration part of this algorithm came from, right? You don't want you don't want a potentially damaged probe randomly thrashing around. You want it to behave very carefully to figure out what's gone wrong, and then assuming it can diagnose what's gone wrong, come up with a compensating controller. Yeah? Okay, just a little bit of background about this project. Okay, so the next stage then, now that we have the algorithm, is how well does it work? As I mentioned, each experiment has two phases. Phase one, undamaged robot. Phase two, damaged robot. We're gonna forget the damage part for the moment. We're gonna run the experiment just to the end of phase one with the intact robot. And we're gonna ask how well does the robot do at with 16 actions bouncing back and forth between the estimation and exploration algorithm, how well does it do at figuring out how it's put together? Then we wipe the slate clean, start the experiment a second time. How well does it do at figuring out how it's put together? Third time, fourth time. We ran this experiment 30 independent times. You can see uh, in outline here, hopefully, how the robot is actually put together, where all the eight parts uh, in addition to the ninth central torso, where all the nine parts should be. And the videos that I, shown you, I showed you uh, last time were drawn from this first experiment. It got all the pieces, it connected all the pieces together, but some of them are a little bit bent. It's not a perfect model, but it's apparently good enough. Yeah. So you'll notice I put uh, a bold uh, outline around experiment one because all the pieces are in the right place. You'll see in the sixth uh, experiment, uh, things weren't quite put together in the right way. Same thing with experiment seven. It put this piece over here. It should have been over here. So in about half the experiments with just 16 actions, it was able to figure out how it was put together. Yeah, 13 out of 30 runs. Okay, next question is, of in all these trials, how well did these self-models, which it had evolved, how well did these self-models allow it to evolve a controller that allowed the physical robot to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table? Ultimately, that's all NASA cares about, right? How, well, how much can you salvage of the mission if something goes wrong? So here are some individual frames drawn from the undamaged physical robot video that I showed you last time. Here's the robot starting at zero seconds. Here's its pose and position at 1.3 seconds, its pose and position at 1.9 seconds, and so on. And this is showing uh, a little over five seconds, which is a little bit more than one uh, cycle of its gait. Yeah. You, you also might have noticed last time that this four-legged robot does not evolve any of the standard four-legged gates, walking, cantering, running. Like your quadruped, it often likes to stay close to the ground. Why? Why does the evolutionary algorithm not tend to evolve standard four-legged gates for, the, for this quadruped or for your quadruped? Why does it often come up with something that keeps the robot relatively close to the ground? It's easier to balance, right? We're selecting for forward locomotion 
for the evolutionary algorithm, it's easy for it to evolve faster and faster locomotion if the evolutionary algorithm also doesn't have to worry about balance, right? Remember the four desiderata of legged locomotion, locomotion in general, yeah? Okay, I then took the simulation. This is the same evolved controller. So here's the evolved controller controlling the physical robot, and here's the evolved controller controlling the simulated robot. And I pulled out frames from the simulation and matched them in time. Last time we talked a little bit about time scales in physics engines. So this is the robot's position and pose at 1.3 seconds of simulation time. This is the simulated robot's pose and position at 2.1 seconds of simulation time, and so on. You'll notice it's actually a pretty good match, but there are certain periods here in which there's a hiccup. During this gait cycle, there's periods in which the physical robot is doing something different from the simulated robot. So we crossed, we did a pretty good job, in my opinion, of crossing the gap here, but again, it's not perfect. What's going on here? Why this hiccup? And why at this particular point in the gait cycle? Any ideas? Well, I think the hiccup is because the center of mass is um, off, and the part of the gait cycle, is it like because it's kind of when it's leaving the ground? Or? Uh, absolutely. So it's leaving the ground. It's maybe a little bit hard to see. Maybe this might help. At 2.3 seconds, it's lifting itself up on its left and right legs. It's sort of balancing here. And then it lifts up its back leg and sort of throws its mass forward. I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go back and play the video, but you can go watch the video if you like. And it rocks forward and sort of slides a little bit along the table. It's actually throwing its momentum and using that as part of its gait. And the mass distribution between these two machines is different. So the way in which that happens is a little bit different between sim and real. Yeah. It's kind of a minor detail. OK, I'll leave this off so you can see these colors. For these 30 experiments, uh, for these 30 experiments here, these 30 different trials, from each of these trials at the end, when they finish, we pull out one evolved controller that this self-model or this self-model predicts is going to cause the physical robot to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. Yeah? So now we're going to test all 30 of these controllers. The robot starts on the table at 0, 0. And again, my apologies for my camera work. This is the left side of the table, and this is the, uh, this is the right side of the table down here. From the robot's point of view, it's moving forward along the table. The robot, we always put the physical robot here. We put a piece of plexiglass on the table, and we, we dropped each of these 30 evolved controllers into the robot. And when the robot stopped moving, we lifted up the robot, and we drew a little blue dot on the plexiglass for where the robot ended up. So you can see um, this is this circled blue dot here. This is the evolved controller that you saw in the video last time. It's the controller that causes the physical robot to do this. It caused the robot to move about 20, 23 centimeters forward along the table. Yeah? OK. We did that for all the other 29 evolved controllers. And you can see most of them are below are below this line. So most of these controllers, with the exception of five of them, most of them are causing the robot to move in the right direction. Yeah? OK. The black dots are the same of 30 evolved controllers, but run on the simulated robot. This is how far the simulated robot moved with those same 30 evolved controllers. What happened here? It's much slower in real life, right? If we connected each blue dot to its corresponding black dot, it's about half the distance, yeah? So again, we're crossing the gap. The robot is doing the right thing, but half as well in reality, yeah? We could have cheated 
we could have tilted the, ro the table downward, right? In which case, any controller would have caused the robot to move in the right direction, and we could have patted ourselves on the back and cheated, yeah? So the red dots are what's known as a control experiment. This is a way for us to rule out, to prove to our colleagues that we're not cheating. We took 30 random controllers and dropped them into the physical robot and drew red dots wherever the physical robot ended up after having used these 30 random controllers. And it stays more or less near the origin. Maybe there's a little bit of a bias in the mass distribution of the robot or the tilt of the table, but not enough to account for the blue dots. Yeah? OK. OK, that ends our discussion of the Resilient Machines project. Um, we conducted this project in 2006. You remember the Golem project from six years before that, uh, which used 3D printers. Both attempts, uh, okay, sometimes we can get robots that cross the gap, sometimes not. So an open question that still existed in 2006 is if you have a controller or even a simulated robot, like in the Golem project, because they were evolving bodies and brains, how do you know? How do you know whether it's going to cross the gap or not? We've seen from both of these experiments that some of them do and some of them don't, but obviously it would be nice before you send something to be printed on the 3D printer or you send a controller to be downloaded on the robot and actually try something to know or have some confidence about whether we're going to be able to cross the gap or not. And that's what was tackled in the next project we're going to look at, which is the transferability project. It's called the transferability project because they're going to evolve controllers in simulation, like we've seen many times before now. But they are going to try and estimate for every evolved controller in simulation its transferability, how well it's likely to transfer to reality. Yeah. OK. How did they do this? They did this by incorporating the, by calculating the transfer, transferability of each controller in the evolving population of controllers and then added it in to the fitness function. Yeah. So they're going to evolve, uh, they're going to evolve against a fitness function that's got two terms in it, how fast the simulated robot moves with that controller and how well that control, how transferable that controller is. That's the approach. But it begs the question, how do you define transferability? How would you define transferability? Um, similar to the graph you showed earlier, it's just like calculating like differences between displacement compared to the simulation and reality. Exactly, right? We take every evolved controller, try it on the simulated robot, try it on the physical robot, the difference or the similarity between the sensor values generated by those two robots, that's transferability. Great. What's the problem with that? The robot could uh, just kind of exploit that to just make a model that just is way more wrong than reality. Okay. Like it does better. Never mind. <laughs> Maybe. It might find a way to exploit that. We now have this hypothetical evolutionary algorithm that's evolving populations of controllers, and it's assigning two numbers to each controller, how far it gets the simulated robot to move and how transferable it is. What's the problem here? By definition, I mean, like, that way to actually obtain the transferability part of the fitness function requires you to actually run it in real life. Exactly, right? In order to compute the transferability for every controller, we have to try every controller on the physical robot why are we using a simulator anymore, right? We're back to just evolving hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or millions of controllers on our physical machine, and we're going to grind it into its component parts long before it ever evolves the ability to walk. So at the outset of this experiment, it looks like there's a bit of a catch-22. We want to evolve transferable controllers that transfer well to reality before we've transferred those controllers to reality. How are we going to do this? Yeah? OK. So uh, as I just mentioned, you are going to see an evolutionary algorithm in a moment that has two fitness objectives. There's two things we're trying to optimize. Desired behavior, which 
like we've seen many times before, is now just speed of travel, uh, like before. We're also going to reward for similarity between simulated and real behavior before we know what this real behavior is. Yeah? We're going to come back to how to cut this Gordian knot in a moment. Okay. How do we deal with these two terms? For many of you in your final project, you're also probably trying to create fitness functions now that select for multiple traits. There's many things you'd like your robot to do. Move as fast as possible and maybe get air or jump along the way. Or move as fast as possible and then lift a block as high as possible or what have you, right? Any two or three terms. As we saw when we looked at the passive dynamic walking robot, you can multiply all the terms uh, together, which works okay. But there's a problem with that. There's a problem with adding terms, multiplying terms together. What's the problem there? I think one problem is with like, if one of them is based on like your scales of the different factors could be very different. And so you could essentially, you know, if one of them is a one or a zero, that could be very insignificant if you're measuring the length of something and adding the two values together where the one and the zero are very small factor comparison to like it moves 10 meters. Absolutely, right? So if we're adding terms together and whatever those two terms are, they have very different ranges, makes sense for evolution to forget about the term that has a relatively narrow range and go after the one that has a big range because maximizing that one is going to swamp whatever contribution it might have potentially gotten out of the second term. So adding terms together not a good thing to do. We can multiply terms together, which gets rid of this range issue, but it's still problematic if we multiply terms together. Why? If a single one of those terms is zero or close to zero, you kind of lose all progress made on the other term. Absolutely. If, so if, if one of the two terms is really difficult and, is, and it tends to be close to zero or almost zero until something very rare happens, so it takes evolution a while to find it, all the fitness values are very near zero and evolution kind of grinds to a halt. You're forcing it to make progress on all the terms simultaneously. It cannot work on one and then sort of come back to the other one. You're, you're hamstringing the evolutionary algorithm. Another problem is that evolution can make a little bit of progress on the hard one and then kind of grind to a halt and say, well, I can't do much here, so I'm just going to keep working on the other one. It can also try and sort of forget about one of the terms. If you add or multiply your terms together, you will see firsthand your evolutionary algorithm struggling with this way of balancing multiple things that you've asked it to do. For that reason, many decades ago, a different approach to evolutionary algorithms was formulated known as MU, multi-objective optimization. So we have multiple objectives, in our case, behavior or speed of travel and transferability. We're going to use this geometric metaphor to understand how MU works. Let's imagine that we have these two objectives. Well, we do have these two objectives. We're trying to maximize both of them. We're looking for a controller that has good behavior and good transferability. Let's take our initial random population of controllers and evaluate each controller and assume that at the end of evaluation, we get back for each controller two numbers, how fast it causes the simulated robot to move and how transferable that controller is. Again, reminder, we haven't talked about how exactly this is going to work yet, but assume it's possible. Yeah? We now have two numbers associated with every controller in the population. We can treat those two numbers as coordinates, which would al allow us to embed all these initial random controllers in a two-dimensional plane. That's what we're looking at here. Yeah? Okay, imagine this is what we have at the end of this first generation, these random controllers. This is a pretty bad controller here. It causes the robot to move very slowly, and this controller is not very transferable. If we were to run it on the physical robot, it's probably not going to do what the simulated robot did. Yeah? Okay, 
if you are writing this evolutionary algorithm, what are you going to do next? You're at the end of the first generation. You, ha you have fitness values for all the controllers. You've got to kill some off and make randomly modified copies of the survivors. Which ones do you kill and which ones do you allow to produce offspring? Okay. And then kind of sneak it up. Okay. And then once you only have however many you want, you know, you start the next generation on the upper side of the line. Okay. Then you eliminate all the ones on the underside. Okay, that's a great idea. So we could create a diagonal line, as you mentioned, and start to sweep it up and to the right. And once we have however many we want to produce offspring on the upper right hand side of the diagonal line, stop and everything on the other side of the line kill off. Yeah? yeah? Okay, how do we know how many we want to allow to produce offspring? We could set a number, five, six, 12, but what's a good number, yeah? This is uh, actually a good, an important question in algorithm design. What we're talking about now is a hyperparameter. We have to, in our constants file, put in a constant, or what's known as a hyperparameter, which is how many do we kill off and how do we allow to survive? Good, in good algorithm design and in, in machine learning, good practice is you want to have as few hyperparameters as possible. Because if you have a lot of hyperparameters and you get your algorithm to work, people are going to say, great, but what happens if those hyperparameters are changed? Does your algorithm still work? So in Moo, as you're going to see in a moment, it's close to what you described, but it's done in a way where we don't have to decide at every generation who die, how many are killed off and how many produce offspring, the algorithm is going to decide for us without a hyperparameter. OK, that's one strong hint. I'm going to give you a second hint. Which is the best controller in this population at the moment? Is it the one where behavior and transferability are closest to each other? Like Equal. Ah, okay. We, you, we could say the one that's the best is the one in which behavior and transferability are close to one another, are, are most similar. You could imagine a controller that's sitting at the origin. It causes the robot to not move, so it gets a behavior of z value of zero and perfect or, per, or terrible transferability, zero. When you transfer it to reality, the physical robot takes off. I don't know if there is such a controller, but that would, that would be two values that are close to one another and intuitively not a great controller. What's the best controller here? You might define it as um, it could be the shortest distance to the, the line, like the diagonal line in which transferability and behavior are equal. Like you basically map each point to the line. So you, the, line, the, the line where behavior and transferability are the same, which would be this diagonal line? Yeah, and then you and then, like basically um, project each point onto the line by a like short distance algorithm. Okay. And then the points that are like when transferred projected to that line are furthest up the line. Okay, possibly we could find the ones that are we could project them onto the line, the ones that are highest up the line. Maybe. Other ideas? I like to throw trick questions at you. There is no best controller here. Well, Did you have an idea? We're getting free robot optimization. Thank you, exactly. What we're looking at is what's known as Pareto optimization, an economist actually. And Pareto pointed out that in many real world problems, if you have a choice among many different things, there is no one optimal solution, yeah? I'd like to buy a new house that's not too expensive and as big as possible, for example, right? Has the big, what's the best house? There is no such best house. I'm going to look at a bunch of houses, some which are larger and smaller than others, and some which are more or less expensive than others. It's a trade-off. So in Pareto optimality, there is usually not one solution that's the best, but among a set of solutions, like these solutions, there's a subset of solutions that together 
are Pareto optimal. Yeah, it's kind of a pessimistic approach to life. You gotta, you gotta swallow the fact that there is no one best thing. There's a set, and among that set, no one individual is any better, any individual solution is better than another. What's the Pareto optimal set in this cartoon example? Or maybe to make it a little bit easier on you, which controllers in here are probably not part of this Pareto optimal subset? Controllers in which there's a different controller that is both more transferable and have better behavior. That's exactly it. So I'll just repeat that again. If you can find a controller like this one down here, for which there is some other controller in the population that's better at both things, it is both uh, causes the simulated robot to move faster, and it's more transferable. Uh, it's more transferable. This individual dominates this individual. So the Pareto optimal set is also known as the non-dominated set. Any individual in the non-dominated set, there is no other individual in the population that is both uh, that is better at both things. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly move the cursor from controller to controller, and you just tell me dominated, non-dominated. How about this one? Just shout it out. Dominated. dominated. I hear non-dominated and dominated. Is there another controller in this popu in the population here? that is both more transferable and more uh, causes the robot to move forward. No, so this is non-dominated. Non, 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 yeah? Okay. Is this like a convex hole problem of some sort? Uh, not quite, uh, close, but as you can see, here's, here are all these individuals, and if we connect them together with lines, it's not necessarily uh, it can be convex, but it, similar, similar. Okay, when I made these slides, uh, the first time I showed them, a couple students noticed that I made a mistake. So I've left the mistake in this slide over the years, so check your intuition. One of these points is mislabeled, which one? This one down here, right? As we just said, this one is non-dominated. So if you're drawing this cartoon, connect this point to this point. Make sure this point is black and connect this point to this point. Yeah? Okay. So it, you'll see that if you draw, you connect all these points together with a line, it looks like a, a weather front or a battle front that you'll see in you know World War II documentaries. This is also known, the set of non-dominated solutions is also known as the Pareto front. You know, these are things all mean the same, the same thing. Yeah. Okay. When we now apply an evolutionary algorithm to these Pareto dominated and Pareto non-dominated solutions, which ones do you think we kill off, and which ones do you think we allow to produce randomly modified copies of themselves? We've done the hard work now. Kill off the dominated ones. So we're going to delete. We're going to delete all of these, and we're left with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven individuals. We did not have to come up with a hyperparameter about how many to kill off, how many to allow to produce offspring. Question: Is the the size of the like non-dominated set? Does that maintain? Is that like relatively stable over the course of the generation? Great question. Is the size of the Pareto front stable? Sometimes yes. Some sometimes no. There's a fascinating. There's fascinating mathematics behind the Pareto front and the fraction of Pareto optimal solutions you get. Um, yeah, it gets complicated. You, you can try it. You can see it's actually not that difficult an algorithm to code up. Those of you looking in your final project to swap out the parallel hill climber and replace it with something else, this is a good candidate. Yeah, pretty pretty simple. 
Okay, so we have in this cartoon example seven survivors, and we've killed off one, two, three, four, five individuals, which means we've got five empty slots in the population, so we need to produce five new offspring. We roll a seven-sided die at random, and whatever number comes up, we pick that individual in the Pareto optimal set, and it gets to produce an offspring. In this cartoon example, we chose at random this parent, and it produced this child. Yeah? Remember that all of the seven individuals here, none of them is better than any other, so they should all have an equal chance to produce offspring. Yeah? We roll our seven-sided die again, pick another parent, allow it to produce a child, and repeat that three more times until we've produced five new offspring. Rinse and repeat. Yeah? Okay, in this cartoon here, this parent has produced this offspring. Uh, this offspring has this transferability, and it causes the simulated robot to move this fast. What happens? What happens in the next generation? Uh, the parent dies, dominated by the child. Yes, uh, evolution it can be vicious at times. The child is better than the parent, kills off the parent, and the Pareto front moves a little bit up and to the right. right? We're looking for controllers up here that are very transferable and cause the simulated robot to move quickly. Yeah? Okay. A short aside about the size of the Pareto front, since you asked. We're looking at two objectives here, yeah? And you can see that in this cartoon example, it's about 50-50, yeah? Imagine we scaled this back, so we only had one objective, let's say behavior, like you've been evolving so far. So all of the points are going to not have an X component because there's no more transferability. The points are just going to have different heights. How many non-dominated solutions can you expect if you were to run this algorithm with just one objective? One. one. There's always going to be one that's higher. So the fraction of non-dominated solutions has now become much smaller, right? If you have n solutions, it's guaranteed that at every generation, the non-dominated set is going to contain one, and the dominated set is going to contain n minus one individuals. Yeah? For two, for two objectives, about 50-50 in this case, what if we went to three objectives? What if we added a third objective, which is to keep the robot's center of mass as low as possible? Now every controller has three numbers associated with it. These points are distributed through a three-dimensional space. And the non-dominated solution is now what's known as a manifold. In three-dimensional space, it's basically a sheet, a two-dimensional sheet that falls over the upper right forward subset of points. I can't draw very well in 3D. Everybody see that? What do you think happens to the fraction of dominated and non-dominated solutions in three dimensions? Ideas? Well, it's a lot lower, but um, I think- Lower in which, oh, which um, way? There's a lot more, um, a, a lot more um, undominated solutions. A lot more non-dominated solutions? Why? Why when we go to higher dimensions are there more, is there a higher fraction of non-dominated solutions to dominated solutions? Because they have to be better in two ways instead of just one and it's a lot more likely that... Um... They need to be better in, in three ways. Oh, yeah, sorry, three yep. ways. Yep, yep, exactly. So it's, e it's relatively easy to be non-dominated in three dimensions because someone else in the population has to be better than you at three things much harder to do, yeah? So the fraction of non-dominated solutions suddenly explodes in three dimensions and becomes much higher, which means in some cases there are no individuals to kill off. There are no dominated solutions whatsoever. As you go from 1D to 2D to 3D as we just did, you can see that the fraction of non-dominated solutions increases. It increases way faster than you might expect 
This is known in mathematics and in computer science as the curse of dimensionality. Has anybody heard of the curse of dimensionality again? No? OK. It's an interesting uh, problem that crops up in lots and lots of different uh, branches of mathematics. And we see it rearing its ugly head here. You could imagine it might be a good idea to evolve controllers that get the robot to move quickly, stay low to the ground, and be, be transferable. Move tends not to work there because evolution grinds to a halt. At an early generation, it says, there's no more individuals to kill off. I don't know what to do. Can you, like, I know we, the, the idea is not to do like the adding and multiplying together factors, but can you kind of pick ones that you think that won't be as big of an issue with and or like reweight addition factors to kind of make a combination of the two strategies? You could try and do that, right? So if things collapse because of the curse of dimensionality at three or higher dimensions, we could weight some of the objectives by how much? Now we've got to come back and we've got to make a new hyperparameter or try and multiply some of the terms together. Tens of thousands of papers have been written on ways to deal with this curse in multi-objective optimization because if somebody can figure it out, it would be great. It's next to impossible to do this for four objectives. If you were to monopolize UVM's supercomputer for a couple days, you could probably do this with three objectives. If you created a population with 10,000 controllers or 100,000 controllers in it, then some of them are going to get unlucky. Yeah. OK, that's a bit of an aside. For our purposes, if you want to use Moo, for the reasons I just mentioned, I advise you to stick with, at most, two objectives. OK, here's some real data uh, from this project that we've been talking about, the transferability project published in 2010, four years after we published the Resilient Machines Project. Here's some actual data. So uh, on the vertical axis, we have the same vertical axis we just had. It's the speed of travel or the covered distance in simulation measured in meters. And we're obviously trying to find controllers that maximize this quantity. On the horizontal axis here, they're not plotting transferability. They're plotting the inverse of transferability, which is the disparity between uh, simulation and reality. So this is approximated sim to real disparity. You want to minimize that. You want to minimize the disparity between what happens in sim and what happens in real. Yeah. You'll notice there's a hint now about how they do this. They're going to approximate this value. Before they send the controller to reality, they're going to, they're going to create something that predicts or approximates how well a given controller is, transfer, is, is transferable yeah? without having to go to reality. OK, so now what optimization is doing is not pushing up and to the, up and to the right. It's pushing up and to the left. We want to maximize this objective and minimize this objective. Yeah? This always makes my head hurt when we mix maximizing and minimizing. If you attempt Moo, I would suggest you either try and maximize all your objectives or minimize all your objectives. And if you do and you tell us about it in Blackboard, tell us which one, which one you're trying to do. It doesn't, doesn't really matter, right? OK. All right, so we can see uh, at, at this particular generation, all of their controllers, if we look at all the Xs, they're sort of huddled down and to the right because they're not very good. The circles are what happened after the dominated, uh, the dominated solutions among the Xs were deleted, and the surviving Xs were allowed to produce randomly modified copies of themselves. That's what the circles are. And you can see, generally speaking, the circles tend to be above and to the left of the x's. Yeah? So, uh, so we're making progress here on pushing the Pareto front up and to the left. OK. They then went through among all the circles and tagged those that are dominated and non-dominated. Here's one dominated solution down here. You can see there are some other solutions that are up and to the left of this solution, which means this solution is dominated by these solutions. We tag it as dominated. There is nothing up and to the left of this individual, so it's non-dominated. 
Yeah? And we could compete the, con continue this process over generations. Yeah? Okay. They took all, all of these controllers, all the circles and all the Xs, and they sent them to their physical robot, which you haven't seen yet, and got back actual transferability values, which leads to this plot. So they're leaving the vertical axis the same. Whoops, sorry. And the horizontal axis has now switched from approximated STR disparity to exact STR disparity. They know exactly how different the behavior is between sim and real. And you can see things have shifted a little bit, but not too much. The X's actually have moved quite a bit. This was their attempt to show that how, how they're approximating uh, how these controllers will transfer from sim to real is pretty good. Not great, but OK. So far, so good? OK, let's keep going. All right, so we're going to use multi-objective optimization to, ma to optimize these two objectives. But again, we still have this problem about computing transferability. We need to try and approximate it somehow. So let's see how we can do this. So let's imagine we're going to run this algorithm. We have run no controllers on the physical robot yet. We have this set of random controllers. We run all of them on the simulated robot. And all of them collapse onto a vertical line because we have no confidence about the transferability of any of these controllers. Yeah, We have basically have them all lined up on the vertical here. Now, now you can choose one to send to reality. Which one are you going to send? This is going to show whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. Probably the one with the best behavior. You're an optimist. OK. Let's, let's be brave. Let's send the one that caused the simulated robot to move as fast as possible. Maybe we'll get lucky and cross the gap. OK. So here we go. We're going to take this one, send it to the physical robot, and here's what happens. This is exactly that controller. Here it is on the simulated robot. We send it to reality, and this happens. How do we do? Started OK, yeah? Oh, well, OK. Sometimes it pays to be an optimist, sometimes not. OK. So this controller, this controller, uh, high fitness in terms of behavior, low fitness in terms of transferability. Yeah. So if we come back here to our geometric metaphor, this point now falls to the left. It has low transferability. Yeah. OK. You get to send a, ne a second one to reality. Which one are you going to send? You're not going to send this one, because you just sent it. What's next? The worst one. OK, we, we, could send, we could send this one. Why didn't we send this one? This one tra travels really quickly in simulation. Why, why aren't we sending this one? It'll be pretty similar to the one we just saw. It'll be similar to the one we just saw, right? So we don't know much about this controller. All we know is it causes the robot to move about the same speed as this one. But intuitively, you can imagine that if this thing is producing similar behavior to this one, it's probably also going to have a similar transferability. Yeah? So you can probably guess where this algorithm is going. It's going to try and approximate or predict the transferability of non-transferred controllers based on their proximity or their similarity to other controllers that have already been sent across the gap. Yeah? OK. We could send this one. OK, we could be very conservative. This one is basically causing the robot to not even move at all. Yeah? We send it. Surprise, surprise. The physical robot doesn't move at all. Maybe we've learned something. We crossed the gap. But we haven't learned much about this particular robot 
and controllers that work for it. We still want to get the physical robot to move. So maybe we pick something in the middle, not something that is similar because it's going to similar, it's likely to similarly fall into the sim to real gap. This, we probably won't learn much. Let's send something in the middle. Yeah? Okay. All right, so now we have a solution to this problem which we identified at the beginning of this lecture, which is that we're gonna try and estimate or approximate transferability of a controller based on the behavioral similarity to a tested controller. We're not comparing their synaptic weights. We're controlling the behavior they generate in the robot. We're not comparing the genotypes of the controllers. We're comparing the phenotypes of controllers. Yeah? Okay. This lecture's filled with problems. What does it mean to measure similarity? In this cartoon example, which I've oversimplified, it's trivial to compare behavior. It's just the speed of travel. Yeah? Imagine, well, not imagine, you saw this robot, which causes the robot to bounce up and down. Maybe this one causes the robot to move a little bit slower than that one, but it moves in a completely different way. It crawls along the ground, yeah? So comparing their fitness or speed of travel, there's not a lot of information there. How could we compare the similarity be between behaviors? Ideas? Okay, let's, let's keep going. What they're going to do in this, uh, in this experiment is they're going to define the behavior as a vector. So for every controller, for every controller, uh, when they run that on the simulated robot, they watch how the robot moves and they compute a number of features. In this, in this first experiment, they used two, uh, sorry, three features that describe the phenotype, not just how fast the robot moves, but how the robot moves. Yeah? The first feature is the thing that we really care about, the distance traveled by the robot. That one we should probably have in there. That's just a floating point number. They then calculated the mean height of the robot during travel. Given our discussions about legged locomotion, clearly it matters whether the robot crawls along the ground or stands on tippy toe or jumps. So measuring the mean height of the robot as it travels, that's probably going to impact whether or not things transfer from sim to reality. And then they picked up on our failure in the Resilient Machines project about the evil starfish that started walking and ended up facing backwards. So the third feature they threw in was the final orientation or the direction that the robot is, is facing at the end of the evaluation period. So far so good? Okay, so after we evaluate every controller, we now have a, a, a vector with three floats in it. Yeah? We can now calculate the, you, the distance between any two controllers by taking the Euclidean distance between their two vectors. Question. Are these, are these floats on similar scales? Uh, they are not on similar scales. They can be completely different. Uh, yeah, okay. exactly. Which could also be an issue. If some of these features have larger ranges than others, that, that's going to factor into the distance calculation more than others. Good, good observation. Okay, so imagine uh, we have controller one and controller two here. We run both controllers on the simulated robot, which generate, first controller generates behavioral vector one, behavioral vector two, take the Euclidean distance between them, gives us a single float back. That's disparity. Or one over this distance is transferability. So far so good? Okay. All right, so how do we use this distance metric to define transferability? We can do one over the distance, or in their case, they just did the negative of the distance, which I'm not a big fan of, because we, we learn in school that distances are always positive. It's a little confusing. It doesn't matter, because they're gonna just plug this into the multi-objective optimization method. They're basically taking the inverse of the distance between the ith controller performed on the simulated robot 
and the IF controller, that same controller run on the real robot. Yeah? That will give us the actual transferability score for C sub I. Yeah? Again, assuming that we've sent this IF controller to reality. Okay. We need to, however, estimate the transferability of controllers in the evolving population before those controllers have been sent to reality. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to collect together into a set the set of already transferred controllers, those that we've sent to reality. And for all of those controllers, by definition, we have a behavioral vector for them from simulation and a behavioral vector for them from reality. Yeah. We're now going to try and estimate the transferability of some controller in the evolving population called C. And we're going to do that by reaching into our bag of already controlled, uh, already transferred controllers, pulling each of these transferred controllers out of the bag, and computing the distance between the behavioral distance between that controller we just pulled out of the bag and the controller for which we're trying to estimate transferability. Yeah. And we're going to multiply it by the transferability, the, the transferability of that controller divided by the distance between that controller and the controller we just pulled out of the bag. Let's look at this summation term for a moment. We're summing up all of the transferabilities of all of the controllers that have been sent to reality. And we're looking to see, uh, we're looking to see, uh, we're multiplying it by this distance here. What is this equation doing? We're pulling out, we're computing the transferability of each transferred controller and multiplying it by its distance from the controller we're trying to estimate transferability for. Let's forget about the denominator for the moment. It's a, norm, it's a normalization term. Forget about normalizing for, for a moment. with farther distance, will um, the transferability of them will be like more important? Uh, yeah, uh, that's right, and that's why it's divided by this. So it's actually the ones that are closer, their transferability has more of an impact on the estimation. Okay. That, that would make more sense, because yep. like, you want the ones, to, like, okay, so like it's just saying that, um, so you're taking into account ones that are actually like it when you're computing its transferability and just like approximating it like that. Exactly. So the easiest way to compute, the simplest way to compute the transferability of C is to just say its transferability is the mean of all the transferabilities of controllers that have been sent to reality so far. It's a pretty good estimate, right? If you're sending controllers, nothing transfers to reality, likely the transferability of C is also terrible, right? That's a good first approximation. We can do a little bit better than that by computing this weighted sum where the influence, uh, uh, the, the influence of the sum is weighted by how close that transferred controller is to the controller for which we're trying to estimate transferability. Make sense? Okay. So that's it. That's how we predict, before we send C to reality, how transferable it is. Yeah? OK. All right. Given that, now we can come back to this question. We've sent a few controllers to reality. We've got our evolving population. Which one do we send next? My thought would be to try to send a controller that is Close in behavior to other controllers? Okay, so we could choose a controller that's very close to ones we've already sent to reality. Maybe not sent to reality already, but just like if there's clusters of um, controllers that in that cluster doesn't already contain one that we sent to reality. I gotcha. Yeah, makes sense. So let's go back to our our geometric metaphor here. 
way back. Okay, so if we had clusters of controllers for which we don't know their transferability, maybe it makes sense to send one of them because whatever that transferability is, it'll probably be a good approximation for a whole bunch of other controllers. It's a good, good intuition. Could do that. It's not what they did. Where did we get to? What else might make sense? Think back to the Resilient Machines project that we talked about last time. There was an intuition there that's gonna be helpful here. Absolutely. So I introduced this concept last time of infotaxis. If you're a machine or an organism and you're relatively well fed, you're relatively safe, you're comfortable in terms of temperature, try things. Try things you haven't tried before. You're in a safe space. Here's a chance to try things new, which is exactly what this algorithm is going to do. It's going to send among the current set of controllers in the, in the evolving population, it's going to send the one that that is most different from those that have been sent to reality already. Yeah? How do we know that? Well, we can just use our distance metric like we did before. We're gonna go through now and compute the diversity for each controller in the population. We're gonna take each controller C and compare it to all the other controllers that have been sent to reality and find, among all the controllers that have been sent to reality, find the one that has the minimum distance. Find the controller that's most similar to the one we're thinking about possibly sending, C, and compute that for all the Cs in the population. So all the Cs now have a diversity metric uh, associated with them. Which one, how do we use the diversity metric to determine which one to send? It's the one that has the highest value, right? It's the one that is furthest from anything, furthest in behavioral space to anything we've sent to reality so far, yeah? So we're taking among the C's, the maximum of the minimums. Everybody see that? Okay, all right, here we go. Just as a refresher, here's the first one they sent when they were optimistic and naive. They sent a bunch of other controllers. We're gonna skip ahead now to the final controller that they sent. Let me see if I can get all four running here. They crossed the gap, it worked. Otherwise we wouldn't be here talking about this experiment. Why did it work? Who knows? Look at the two videos in the left column. What's the difference? It's moving its back legs more in the top left. Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe. It, it maybe has more exaggerated movements. Let's have a look at the two, let's look at the videos in the, the, in the right hand column. I think you're right, yeah, maybe that makes a difference. I don't know how many times I've watched these videos, I can't figure it out, I don't know. As usual, evolution is smarter than, uh, than I am, at least. Questions? The, this, yeah, the lower, the lower row is the final controller sent. So wouldn't that just mean that it's the one that like, had the, um, like, that had the lowest diversity, right? Because you're sending it in order of diversity? It's the one that, this one, when it was sent from sim to real, at that time, it had the highest diversity, okay. meaning it was as different 
in terms of behavior as anything else in the population. But it, it doesn't look that different from the first one that was sent. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, why, why would that one like be special? Like, there's, is that just the reason that's the last one because they decided decided to stop there because it's good or like? Let's hope they didn't because that's not good scientific practice. Let's hope they had a fixed set of action or a fixed set of controllers that they were hoping to transfer. And by this point, the algorithm had converged on controllers that had good behavior and all of, most of them tended to have high transferability, and it was a good estimate of transferability because they've sent enough to reality. Oh, okay, so your transferability estimate is like your means of computing that gets better the more you send. Absolutely. You so remember that this set, as evolution proceeds, and every once in a while they're sending new controllers to reality, this set is getting larger, which in theory, and it seems in practice, means that the estimate of transferability is also getting better and better. And it's getting better and better, hopefully thanks to info taxes, because you're sending lots of different, different things. They probably did end up sending the controller that just caused the robot to sit there and do nothing, because that would have been behaviorally very different from some of the early things they probably sent to reality. I don't think they reported, I don't think they had a supplementary section for this paper where they showed everything that had been sent, but that would be my guess. Yeah. Okay. That takes us to the end of the transferability project. And we are actually running ahead of schedule, which is great. We have seven minutes left. So I'm going to bring up lecture 19 and I'll just introduce it. My apologies. I haven't had a chance to put up the uh, slides yet. I will put them up uh, after class. Okay. Okay, so we just looked at uh, we just looked at the transferability project. This is uh, this is another attempt to cross the reality gap, uh, which was quite successful. It ended up being published in the flagship scientific journal uh, Nature. So some people found this interesting. What you're going to see tackled in this uh, in this experiment is a, a, a real focus on how quickly can we cross the gap. Infotaxis helps because you're, you're performing exploratory actions, but exploration and curiosity has a, has a cost, as we've all learned uh, over many decades, which is a lot of the crazy new things that you try, they don't work, they don't provide a lot of new information. In retrospect, they were sort of a waste of time. So can you come up with a way to very, very carefully choose what to do next so that First of all, you get new information back from the real world, but there's also a good chance that that experiment also lets you do whatever we want the robot to actually do. So instead of breaking actions into two different sets of actions, those that help you learn about yourself and the world around you, and those that help you actually get the job done, can you collapse these so you're searching for actions that do both? They give you new information and let the robot start moving as quickly as possible. Yeah. Uh, animals tend to be very good at this. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I think this dog has had some experience for quite a while uh, with three legs. There's lots of examples of organisms and humans where something suddenly comes wrong, goes wrong, and within a few seconds, you can adapt. When you're traveling on ice and you start to slip, you have about half a second to try a few things out before committing to something. Organisms are very, very good at this, at exploring and exploiting very, very quickly. Okay, so uh, inspired by our work, uh, this set of authors tried something similar. They're gonna use this particular six-legged robot that you see here, and they're going to injure this robot. And on wall clock time, they're actually gonna watch the clock on the wall and see how long it takes for this machine to adapt. 
This project was also done in response to uh, a NASA need, which is in some cases, NASA says, something seems to be wrong with, uh, with the rover. You have all the time in the world to figure out what's gone wrong. Take your time, be careful, because if you do something wrong, you're gonna kill our multi-million, possibly multi-billion dollar machine, yeah? We know that you have all the time in the world because the accelerometer, which measures acceleration, sitting on the rover is registering zero, which means the robot's just sitting still, not doing anything. So you got plenty, plenty of time to figure something out. Alternatively, NASA, uh, NASA says or tells the robot, figure out what's gone wrong as quickly as possible because your accelerometer is reporting increase in values. What does that mean? What's going on with the rover? It's moving. It's, moving. it's not just moving. It's speeding, it's speeding up. It's sliding down the side of a giant crater and it's picking up speed. You've got maybe two and a half seconds, four seconds, six seconds to figure out what's gone wrong and come up with a way to recover. So the emphasis, as you're gonna see in the IT and E algorithm here, intelligent trial and error is speed. Okay, what you're gonna see is in the video that I'll show you next time, they're gonna evolve for forward travel like we've seen before. They're gonna do one trial in which the robot moves 0.11, uh, moves 11 centimeters uh, per second, not very fast. It's had its left front leg damaged. Second trial, it moves twice as fast, but not very fast. Third trial, by the third trial, it's already starting to uh, compensate for the injury. And by the fourth trial here, it's basically compensated almost 100% for the injury. Very, very fast recovery. Next time, I will tell you how it actually goes about doing so. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. You're working on your final project. Have a good rest of your week. Thanks.